48 pounds in 12 weeks. All right, talking about weight loss, rapid weight loss, effective weight loss. Is it possible? How plausible is this? One of the reasons why I decided to talk about this is because we see um, tremendous, revolutionary, drastic before and after pictures from people sometimes, right? When you go on the internet um, and you'll see one person on, on, on one side, right? And they'll have all kind of shapes and rolls and everything like that on their body, right? They've been struggling through, li through their life, going, some, going through some stuff, right? Metabolically. And they packed on extra shapes and body fat compartments and such, right? And then on the other side, you see a beautiful transformation, right? The waist is tailored and tucked in, everything's sitting up right. Even the belly button is higher up, right? They, they, they're a different color. They're more tan and all types of stuff, right? All kinds of changes, right? And you go, you look at that, you go, wow, that's very impressive and motivated. Beautiful before and after pictures, right? How do you do that in such a short period of time? 90 days. 90 days. And it's like they drop 30 pounds in 90 days. They drop 60 pounds in 90 days, 45 pounds in 90 days. You go, wow, that's a big deal, right? These body transformations. What is the magical secret? Is there a magical secret, right? Now, it's not necessarily magical, and there's a variety of ways to get there, right? Of course, um, you're going to have to trade something to get there. It's going to cost you, right? And the, and the price tag can be quite high, right? Because rapid weight loss isn't necessarily a health goal, right? It could actually cost you your health, right? And you go through people who go through intense rapid weight loss, and then, and then next thing you know, they put the weight back on real quick. Right, so that's one of the consequences. I'm not saying you shouldn't pursue a goal like that because there is a very healthy and effective way to do it, right? But it depends on how you go in and it depends on how you come out, right? So I'll tell you how typically the, the best approach that I've come up with. And there's, there's actually two different approaches, but I'm going to talk about one. Sticking my fingers up and my, my camera's probably gonna start following me around now, maybe. Alright, so as far as the two approaches are concerned, now as far as your metabolism is current concerned and it comes to weight loss, when we want to lose weight, typically we want to drop body fat specifically. So we don't want to lose weight from like bone mass and muscle tissue and just lose a bunch of water weight and no fat. We don't want to do that. When we lose weight, we want our we want the body weight that we lose to come from body fat, right? So if we want to drop 48 pounds in 12 weeks, we want to drop at least like 45 pounds of body fat, right? We want to drop 42 pounds of body fat, right? Um, but to be honest, a lot is going to be water weight. So for example, you can drop the 40, what is it, 48 pounds in 12 weeks, but a lot of it will be water weight, right? So once you start eating again, you may shoot back up about five pounds or so, right? So just be aware, don't freak out. Oh no, I'm going in the opposite direction. All the weight's coming back on. Don't freak out just yet, right? But in particular, as far as dropping body fat, burning body fat, this primarily happens when you are in a glycogen deficit, a glucose deficit, right? This happens mainly in the absence of available glucose from carbohydrates or really any form of food, right? So the longer you go at a fasted blood sugar level and the longer you go with a low glycogen level, the more your body is going to lean into metabolizing fat for energy. And this becomes an escalatory thing. If you really want to lean all the way into your fat metabolism, there's a couple ways to do this. Number one, you can cut all the carbohydrates out of your diet and have most of your, 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 your food intake come from protein and fat. You could do that, but the thing is you, you can wreck your metabolism. With doing it. It's not free second option is fasting you can just fast to the point where you're not eating at all right there's no presence of food which means that whatever whatever resources whatever energy your body needs it's going to have to get it from stored energy 
right? So that's when we're talking about fasting. Now, number one, you can fast for seven days and within seven days, you can drop like 10 pounds, 12 pounds or something. It's not quite the 48. So that's not really the mode I'm talking about. You can do 21 days, but keep in mind the longer you fast, once you get past the three days, that's when your body will start breaking down uh, lean mass, muscle tissue, right? Because your body needs amino acids. And when there are no amino acids coming from food, when well, now your body is going to have to start breaking down muscle in order to get the amino acids, right? Now, this is not going to happen to a tremendous degree, but the longer the fast goes, the more that happens, right? And that becomes this escalatory thing where you start lean, you start losing way too much of that muscle, right? You start losing that and you don't want to lose that. You just want to drop body fat. So the prolonged, really extensive fast beyond three or seven days is probably not a great bet. What we want to do is we want to drop out of that 48 pounds. We want it to mostly come from body fat, not muscle mass or bone mass or anything, right? So we're not talking about that. We want to retain as much muscle mass as possible, okay? So now this brings us to alternate day fasting, which is my preferred way going to explain why okay and i'm going to give you the alternative because there is a version that works very well for men and then there's one that works very well for women men and women can't really fast the same way well you could but you probably shouldn't right and, and you, you, there's a difference for hormonal reasons um men do very well with fasting Women do very well with fasting, but the thing is you have estrogen and you have progesterone. And there's a bit of a counterbalancing relationship between the two. So in a fasted state, this could play very well for estrogen, but not so well for progesterone. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to fast or do anything aggressively to the point where it's just going to really impede your progesterone levels to the point where you create a hormonal imbalance between the two, right? So that's the thing you got to be careful about. But I'm going to talk about, I'm going to get to that, right? But I'm going to talk about the, the, the alternate day fasting concept first, right? So essentially, um, alternate day fasting, for example, is where you basically eat every other day. So you can have three fasting days a week and then you can have uh, four eating days a week. So for example, you can eat Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, and then you can fast Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. All right. Now, in order to drop 48 pounds in 12 weeks, essentially you would have to drop uh, four pounds a week. All right. Now, Mathematically, the way that you would do that is you would basically be losing all of your weight within the three days. You would be burning all of your fat within the three fasting days. I call this a, a specific thing because there's a variety of different ways to do alternate day fasting. I prefer train feast fast. Right, so train feast fast. And so essentially what you do is you fast or really, you train, then you feast, and then you fast. Or you can feast and then train and finish your feast and then fast. Depends on your schedule. But on the days that you're eating, those are the days that you're training. And then on the days that you're fasting, those are the days that are kind of low effort days, but you're still doing like a steady state, slow pace and cardio, for example. If you're gonna do a high intensity cardio, Eh, it depends on the type you do. It can get a little dicey. If you're going to do it, you can't do it for very long, right? Um, so the steady state is much more sustainable, right? So on your eating days, the reason why it's a feast is because you eat a bit more than normal. So like, let's say um, in order to maintain your lean mass and uh, training performance capabilities, you need to you need to eat a certain amount of resources, right? A certain amount of calories, a certain amount of carbs, fats, proteins, that kind of thing. So people call this maintenance calories. 
So in order to retain your strength, your muscle mass and all of that type of stuff, in order to retain an optimal level of vitamins and minerals and amino acids and things like that, you'd have to eat a certain amount. Okay. Let's say on average on your training days, you burn, let's say 2,600 calories. You'd want to eat a bit above that, right? So maybe you want to eat around 3,000 calories a day or something like that, or 3,100 or 3,100 or something like that, right? 3,200. 3,200 may be a bit too much. It depends on how raw you're eating. But the moral of the story is you want, and rather than eating 100% at maintenance, maybe you want to eat at 120 or 125% of, uh, of your maintenance calories. So basically an extra 20 or 25%. Right. Um, that would be the solid math behind that. I don't really focus so much on calories so much. I really focus on like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So you find out what your lean body mass is, what and basically you find out what your body fat percentage is, and then you subtract your body fat percentage weight from your total weight, and that would give you your lean mass, and then you calculate your carbs, fats, and proteins from that. Right? So let's say rather than doing one gram of protein per kilogram of lean mass, you do, let's say, 1.4, maybe even 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of lean mass. Rather than doing um, five grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of lean mass, maybe you do six grams of carbs per kilogram of lean mass. Right? Maybe you do seven grams of carbs per kilogram of lean mass. Right? So if you normally do four or you normally do five, maybe you want to do bump it up to six or seven. If you've been doing, if you've been eating a half a gram of fat per kilogram of lean mass, maybe you want to eat a whole gram of, of fat per kilogram of lean mass or eat uh, 1.2 grams of fat per kilogram of lean mass, right? So you can notch that up. And it depends on your food choices. It depends on how raw you've been eating, that kind of thing. Uh, and it depends on what your training split looks like also. So there's a variety of different ways to do this. Right? It also depends on um, how well fed you were and how good you are at fasting before going into this kind of thing. Right? So your eating days, you spend that on building strength and muscle mass. And then on your fasting days, that's where you really focus on maximizing fat burn for energy. So let's say um, your basal metabolic rate is 1,800 calories or 1,900 or whatever the case is, 1,700, somewhere around, there, right? Depending on how much you weigh, the more you weigh, the more your basal metabolic rate will go up. And your basal metabolic rate is... Um, the bare minimum amount of calories your body burns, right? So this is the amount your body burns without any exercise or activity whatsoever. So this is like, this is the floor. In other words, your body is not gonna burn less than this amount. That is the minimum amount of caloric burn that your body needs to engage in just to be able to just live, right? To be able to perpetuate its existence, right? So let's say you walk on that on that day, you walk five miles or six miles, 10 miles or whatever the case is. So you can walk a certain amount of miles to the point where by the end of your fasting day, you've burned 26, 2,800 calories, somewhere around. There. Like 2,800 is a good number, right? So let's say you burn that 2,800 reason why this is important is because one pound of fat is 3,500 calories, right? Let me brush up on my math here. Let me whip out, whip out my calculator to make sure I'm right exactly. So let's say four pounds of fat. We do 3,500 times four. So we got to burn 14,000, right? We got to get pretty close to that. All right, so let's say within three days, you got to burn 4,600 calories. All right, uh, per day. 
Now you may say, well, that seems kind of high. I don't know if that's doable, right? And on your fasting days, it's not. But there's, a, there's an interesting thing here that happens with the human body. And that's because when you fast, the more you fast, your insulin sensitivity improves. And your metabolism shifts gears to the point where even though one pound of fat is 3,500 calories, it's not, the, it's not all of the weight you lose. Because you burn fat and your body drops water weight. Not to mention your food has a certain amount of weight. And if you do a 36 hour fast, for example, then all of the weight from the food will pass through your digestive tract within a 36 hour period, give or take. So if it is, let's say several pounds, let's say four or five pounds of food, and that passes all the way through your digestive tract. And when your digestive tract is empty, you also will retain less water. So then you'll drop an additional few pounds. Okay. Now, the reason why this is important is because if you go through that fasting day and you do a 36 hour fast in between your eating days and you burn 2,800 calories from fat, right? Let's say you burn the 2,800 calories a day. So 2,800. And let's say you do that three days a week. It's 8,400 calories. Right? So this is a little above uh, two pounds of fat, but it's two pounds of fat plus like, let's say five pounds from like food and water and whatnot. So what happens is within a week, you can actually drop seven pounds or so within a week if you had the three fasting days, right? This is kind of roughly how that would look. Right now, this is going to vary from person to person. I'm just talking about what's possible and what I've seen play out with people, including myself, because I've done this. So I'm talking about what's possible and then I'm and then I'm going to talk about what's a good thing to shoot for, because you may not need to shoot for the whole 40, uh, eight pounds in 12 weeks. You could, but you may not want to for reasons I'm going to explain. I'm just talking about I'm just addressing the 48 pounds. So let's say every week, let's say your first week you drop six pounds doing this. Depending on where your starting point is, you might drop seven pounds in your first week. Right? And then what happens is, you know, you can in one day drop four pounds. And then the next day you gain back three pounds. And then the fasting day after that, you drop another four pounds, maybe even five. And then the next day after that, you go up another three pounds. So what happens is you keep notching down every fasting day you do. If you eat back to back on Sunday and Monday, then you'll probably notch back up another four pounds or whatever, or maybe just another three pounds and hold. And then the next week you repeat. So you keep stepping down, stepping down, stepping down. So there's a trend that you establish throughout the 12 weeks. Now, if you wanted to be really zealous, you were like, I'm going to walk a minimum of 10,000 steps every single fasting day, and I'm going to burn two, maybe even three pounds of just straight up body fat within the week, each week, right? Now, keep in mind that this is just on your fasting days. I'm talk I'm just talking about the amount of fat that you burn on your fasting days. I'm not even talking about the amount of fat that you burn on your eating days because you actually burn fat on your eating days. It's not just fasting days that you burn body fat. It's all of the days. Right? This all adds into the 48 pound weight loss deal. So you can say, well, how do you burn body fat in your eating days? Well, the reason why is because let's say, for example, your diet is 65% carbs. So the overwhelming majority of your food intake is carbohydrates. Okay. Why is that important? It's because when you consume carbohydrates, the carbohydrates break down into glucose and that glucose gets sucked right up into your muscle tissue. 
It gets used by your brain and all your vital organs and stored inside muscle tissue and, and, and your liver. And then whatever's left over goes to body fat. But the thing is, is that after the fast, your insulin sensitivity jumps up because your body is craving that glucose. It's been deprived of that glucose. So that one day is a shock, right? So as soon as you start eating again, that glucose is going to get su sucked right back up in there. Then on your training days, right, because your training days are also your eating days, so you're actually going to burn through your glycogen stores in your eating days as well. So you deplete your glucose further on your eating days. Recovering from the workout requires fat metabolism as well, even with eating. So you're not replacing any of the body fat that you burned on your eating days. So that contributes to that downward trajectory of weight loss. And it contributes to the ever increasing amount of body fat that you're burning through for stored energy. And your insulin sensitivity improves week after week after week after week. Right? This is a great way as well for reversing a fatty liver. Right, so if you have a fatty liver, this could be a really good idea. If you have kidney issues, this can also be a very good idea. Right, so any type of kidney disease or whatever the case is, this can go towards, towards that as well. There's some things that you got to do on your fasting days, though, to really maximize the benefit. Because it's not just the fasting in a vacuum that works. There's certain things that you do on your fasting day that contributes to the success. Right? So following that trajectory, doing the 10,000 steps, doing the 36 hour fasts, that would all contribute to getting to that 48 pounds of weight loss within 12 weeks because you've been dropping at least four pounds each week, right? Now for women, it's gonna be a slight difference. For women, you may wanna do a 24 hour fast. Right? You may want to fast throughout the entire day on your fasting days and then have like a five or 600 calorie meal before bed. The reason why that's relevant, the reason why you should do that is because going to bed on an empty stomach can be very stressful, right? And it can interfere with your sleep quality and that can create a hormonal disruption. All right. Now, this isn't the case for like all women across the board. It depends on what your starting position is, and it depends on how balanced your hormones were before you started. Um, if you have a hormonal imbalance where estrogen is high, but progesterone is low, it's probably not a good idea to do this. Um, right. So there's there's that caveat there. You want to focus on balancing your hormones first. And the primary way that you do that is you have to eat your way out. Right, so an aggressive weight loss strategy may not be a good idea to do. Um, if fasting makes you miserable, chronic headaches, brain fog, but uh, it's just a miserable experience. It's, it's, it's depleting and you just, you, you can't get up, walk, do anything, get a headache all day long dry mouth, whatever the case is, you feel terrible. It's probably not a good idea to do because you have to actually, um, you have some type of deficit going on, right? It could be vitamin, mineral issues, could be a hormone instability, that kind of thing. It could be from a long trend of just getting poor sleep quality every day. So you would actually have to focus on um, feeding yourself, fueling up and normalizing the fueling up, right? Eating more than you normally do, right? replenishing the resources of your body right so like what the strategy that i'm talking talking about it is an extensive and advanced strategy and it's not really for everybody right because you have to start at a specific spot this is a great way to break to break a plateau right so like let's say um you've been resistance training um You've had a lot of success so far. You've built muscle and all that type of stuff. Um, you've you've mostly repaired your metabolism, right? You've reversed a lot of the damage that you did. You did a lot of work to improve things, right? 
and now you're stuck at kind of like this hitch or this hurdle where you need to get off the last bit of weight, right? In order to get to your ideal weight. This may be a good way to do it, right? Also keep in mind that the strategy that I'm talking about, this is the kind of strategy that you do once a year. You do it once. You may not even need to do it next year. You may just want to do it once. If you're going to do it, you do it once a year tops. You don't do it more than once a year, just once. Because in the grand scheme of things, there's a zero sum game between just focusing on building muscle and focusing on burning fat. You can do both at the same time, but not to an extreme degree. So you kind of have to pick. Are you in a building phase or are you in a cutting phase? You're going to pick. It's a, it's a lot easier to drop body fat than it is to build muscle. Right? So it depends on where you're coming from. It also depends on your age, right? Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise this for somebody who's like 60 or 70 years old or something like that. Somebody who is at that age, a better goal would be to build up as much muscle mass and bone mass as you can, which requires you to have pretty consistent eating habits. Now, if you're in like your 50s, 55 or whatever the case is, you could do this for a short period of time before a modified degree. So you may want to do um, 20 hour fasts, right? But only do it maybe uh, uh, like a, for a short period of time, maybe eight weeks tops right? to drop body fat. Right. But th it depends on the circumstances. It's not a thing that I generally recommend. It's very circumstantial. It depends on where you're at. Right? It depends on how you've been doing with your sleep quality and all of that kind of stuff, right? So I got to put those disclaimers in there because I'm, I always tell people there are no magic bullets. There are very effective strategies, but none of them are free, right? So just being realistic about what it would take, what's possible, that kind of thing. Now, for me personally, I'm not a big fan of, of calorie cutting, right? Most people who are struggling to lose weight and whatnot, they're underfed most of the time because they've been cutting calories for so long trying to lose weight. So you actually have to go back in the opposite direction and you have to eat more food because you need more magnesium, more zinc, more selenium, more vitamin A, more B vitamins, right? You need more, more of your, more proteins, more of your essential fatty acids. Your body has to get used to having, having adequate levels of glycogen to power your muscles, your brain. Uh, brain chemistry, hormonal balance, all of that kind of stuff. You gotta eat your way out. So you can't just keep cutting, 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 cutting because you're gonna get stuck doing it. Because you can cut down to 16, 1500 calories per day. But once you cut to 1200 per day, that's it. You can't go below 1200 and you can't even stay at 1200 for any significant length of time. You can probably get away with staying at 1200 calories a day for like six weeks or so. After that, you really start seeing diminishing returns and it, feel, it can feel quite miserable. And then you gotta start working your way back up to getting, you know, at that 1800, 1900, 2000 calories a day. For men, it would be a lot more than that, right? For, for men, right, the floor is kind of like 1800 calories a day and then you start notching up from that. But again, that's circumstantial because it depends on body composition, training age, and that kind of thing, right? But alternate day fasting, this is one of the, this has been one of the, the, the most effective ways um, that I've been not only able to drop body fat really quickly for myself, but also for other people. So, for example, I'll do this strategy, get to 6% body fat, and then focus on building muscle for the next calendar year. And I might have some slip-ups or so and end up at like 10, 12% body fat. I do the, the 12 weeks or the 16 weeks or so, and I can cut from that 12% body fat or even 14% body fat and cut back down to the 6. That's why I only do it once a year, right? So you, doing this kind of strategy, you can drop 6% body fat, 4% body fat or so within like a 12 weeks or 16 week period. Okay. You don't really need to pursue fat loss all year. Some people may need to, you may need to take it slow and easy, but you know, if you're, do, if you're committing to it for a whole entire year to lose body fat, you're not really committing to losing 
body fat all year, what you're doing is you're committing to improving your metabolism. So your body lets go of the fat easier. This is really the key to weight loss. You have to eat your way out for the most part, right? But I'm talking about a more aggressive strategy to losing weight. So the, the model typically, if I program or I write a diet plan for somebody doing alternate day fasting, let's say for it's a man, let's say it's a man doing this, 36 hour fasts, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. All right. And then on the eating days, you're eating at 120 to 125 percent of maintenance calories. Uh, your training sessions are typically like three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You can either do full body on all three days or you can do a push pull leg split. Your training sessions should not exceed 30 minutes, right? So your training sessions should be around 20 to 30 minutes. If you're going to train intensely, you don't want to burn through all of the resources that you're supposed to be stockpiling for the fast. So the longer your workout is, the more detrimental it's going to be. Okay. Um, now you can get away with pushing it past 30 minutes. You can train for an hour, but the thing is that that's going to cut into the, the amount of muscle mass that you can build on your eating days. Cause with this alternate day fasting strategy, you can build muscle mass doing this. You can actually gain more muscle doing this, but if your training sessions are running too long, you can actually stunt your growth as a result because you're just training for too long. And the reason why is because the longer your training session is, the more recovery is required. And so that requ that recovery is going to be negatively impacted if you got to recover from all of this wear and tear on your body during a fasting. Right? That's why you want it to be short and sweet. If you do the alternate day fasting, uh, you got to hit those miles. You got to walk those miles on the fasting day. All right. If you're sedentary on your fasting days, you're going to get very marginal gains doing this. All right. Uh, so you're not really going to burn body fat to any significant degree doing that if you're sedentary on your fasting days. If you're going to do, you have 12 weeks, you're on the clock. So you got to end at that 12 weeks or you got to end at that 16 weeks. 16 weeks is kind of long for most people. I'll say 12 weeks. So if you got 12 weeks, three months, 90 days, you got to make every single fasting day count because you only get to do this once a year. You only get to do it once. Let's say you're a man, you're 20% body fat. You can do this strategy and drop from 20% body fat down to 14%. Right? Right? You drop down to that 14% body fat, and then you spend the rest of the day, of the year gradually shedding the body fat through appropriate eating habits and muscle building. And by the end of the year, several months later, you can get from that 14% down to like 12, 10%. I want to say 10%. You get down to like 10% by putting on more muscle mass and you know losing uh, you know some more body fat by default. So you can close out at 12, 10% body fat in the calendar. That's how you actually spend the calendar year, um, getting from 20% body fat to 10%, right? So that real quick start, uh, train feast fast, alternate day fast, so you go from that 20 that 20% down to that 14%, and then you shave off the next 4% uh, afterwards um, in a conservative fashion, really focusing on building muscle, right? And, and making the best food choices. And then the next calendar year, if you want to get below 10%, you can do it again and get the 6%. And then you can maintain that 6% for the rest of the year. And you can you can undulate between 6 and 8% or undulate between 6 and 10% and spend the rest of your life there. You can spend the rest of your life never getting past 10%. You can just maintain in between that 6 and 10% for the rest of your life. But you got to be disciplined about doing that, right? So this is the strategy. For women, right, you eat before bed, you don't have a large meal, like around five, 600 calories, because typically overnight in your sleep, you'll burn around 500, 600 calories in your sleep, right? So you typically want to have a tryptophan rich, uh, protein rich, uh, magnesium rich, zinc rich, selenium rich meal before bed. 
right? So it would be a good idea to have a smoothie with, let's say, some pea protein, some, some hemp milk, um, like a couple bananas, four Brazil nuts, um, you know, some cinnamon, a little bit of sea salt for electrolytes or iodized salt for the extra iodine. Right? But just make a smoothie, and that smoothie could be with things like that. So you're getting the zinc and the selenium and the magnesium and whatnot in the smoothie. You get some carbs, B vitamins, things like that in the smoothie. You can put five grams of creatine in there and blend that up and then drink that and then go to bed. Right? And what you can do is that can be a head start on the eating day. So you can tack on that five or 600 calories that you had before bed and just tack that on to the amount that you would eat for the next day afterwards. So if your goal is to eat 20 to 2,400 calories or so, the, uh, or even 2,600 calories, whatever your number is, the next day you can tack on, you can just add on that 500 into the calculation right so that would count towards the next day right? so that's another way that you can do that math as well right. uh last but not least what i'm going to say here is on your fasting days you go well what do you what do you do on your fasting days if you're not eating well you stay hydrated you drink water and teas things like that i've been talking off a storm here my tea getting Herbs and spices. Herbs and spices. If you if you really want to maximize fat metabolism, one of the things you got to understand is there's different types of fat and they don't all burn equally. You've got white fat, which is the dormant fat that doesn't really, it's not really metabolically active at all. It's cold. It's in deep storage. It's stubborn fat. It's not going anywhere. Then you got beige, then you got brown. The brown fat is the most active fat. That's the fat that's on the front line that is the quickest to metabolize for energy. A lot of the stubborn fat that people struggle to burn is actually the white fat. The fasting days are really beneficial for burning white fat, okay? Now, to further accelerate the usage of that white fat and turn it into brown fat, there are certain herbs and spices that you can drink in teas. A great example is during the 12 weeks, you drink anywhere from two grams to four grams of Moringa tea per day, right? So you get four grams of Moringa powder. So it's two grams of Moringa powder twice a day, two grams in the earlier portion of the day and two grams around midday, let's say. Moringa tea. So Moringa is, uh, it, it's an antioxidant, right? Well, it has antioxidants in it that helps to keep your stress down. And then it has chemical compounds to help to improve fat metabolism. It's also a hedge against stress so that it can actually bolster progesterone production. So Moringa is very good for that. All right. Then you've got matcha tea. Matcha has caffeine in it. So it'll kick on your adrenal glands a little bit, and that aids into further fat metabolism, right? And there's a chemical compound in matcha tea, because it is a form of green tea, called EGCG. And that accelerates fat metabolism as well. So when you combine something like that to your with your fasting, um, that has tremendous beneficial results on, you know, dropping body fat and getting to your goal weight, right? Or getting closer to it. So let's say you wake up first thing in the morning, you have your Moringa. You don't really, you don't need to get caffeinated right away, right? Keep your powder dry, as they say. So you have your Moringa first, and then if you start to feel a little tired, you're low on your energy, that's when you do, let's say a half a teaspoon of matcha powder in your cup, fill it with eight to 10 ounces of water, and you drink your matcha tea. You get a nice little boost in energy from that. A 
and you can drink that before your walk. Right? To get the miles in. Another option is uh, ginger tea or ginger turmeric. So one gram of ginger, one gram of turmeric in the mug, eight ounces of water, and you can drink that. That helps to improve insulin sensitivity, reverse fatty liver, balance hormones, uh, all types of stuff, right? So it's a big deal. Help to heal your gut. Also, uh, ginger and turmeric are antifungal, antibacterial, and antiviral. So this can also maintenance your gut and kill off uh, excess candida buildup or yeast or harmful bacteria in your gut, a potentially brewing virus where you can inhibit the viral load, all of that type of stuff when you're fasting. Today. So that's really beneficial in that regard as well. And you can alternate. So moringa, matcha, ginger, turmeric, and then back to moringa. And then you can even do the ginger turmeric again. So you can just be drinking your teas throughout the day. You may want a cold beverage. You may want something cold to drink. So what you can do, and you need electrolytes, right? That's a good idea as well. So let's say you do your walk. Let's say you walk your five miles. After your five miles, you get four to six ounces of water and you get magnesium malate, right? And you get a, a half a teaspoon of magnesium malate and you plop that in the water and you add a pinch of iodized salt, right? Or Celtic salt, right? So you get that mineral balance. Magnesium is a very important electrolyte, right? And then you can add the sodium as well. And then, so you get your electrolytes that way. Okay, and you can do squeezed lime also four to six ounces of water, drink that down like a shot. And what that does is that helps to maintain muscle retention, okay? Uh, as well as the recovery from the energy expenditure and the lack of glucose, All right? Um, and this helps to alkalize your blood to maintain your body's pH balance and your energy level and keep your stress down and things like that as well. So that magnesium and that sodium, well, that's a big deal to get you through on your fasting days. That can also help to help you avoid uh, headaches, right? Lethargia, brain fog, things of these nature. this nature, so I can help with that as well. Uh, the particular magnesium malate that I use, a half a teaspoon, is like a full 420 uh, milligrams of magnesium. So it's a very potent dose. So you really only need to do it like once a day. All right. Um, right before bed at night, you can actually supplement with magnesium glycinate if you wanted to improve sleep. So for example, right before bed at night, you do, uh, let's say, 210 milligrams or one gram of magnesium glycinate before bed and you pair that with like 30 grams of zinc picolinate that would be a good suggestion for women and then for men it can be 60 milligrams of zinc picolinate with the magnesium before bed and that can help with the sleep quality now for women you probably don't need to do this because if you take my suggestion with the smoothie you'll get the magnesium and the zinc with the smoothie All right There's other different strategies that you could deploy on your fasting days as well, but that in particular is just one of them. All right. All right, I did well on time. I'll wrap it up there. Let's catch up with these comments here. <laughs> 